be answering them in real time as we progress through the presentation. All right, we're just double checking everything is set. As noted, it is recorded. And if for some reason you're not able to utilize the QA or the chat, just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll be keeping an eye on all of those areas. We are about three minutes after, so hopefully everyone has had a chance to grab their lunch, something to eat, and they're ready to learn. Just a quick reminder, Improving hosts these virtual lunch and learns every Wednesday at noon central. You can learn more about our talks at improving.com through our thoughts page. Um, we have a wide variety of topics. So if something seems, um, if there is a specific interest you have, you are likely to find a speaker or a topic that we will be hosting. And of course, all of our talks that we've given in the past are also available through our website. Today, I have the honor and privilege of introducing Devlin Lyles. Devlin is our Chief Consulting Officer and also the President of the Houston Office and Improving. So I've had the honor and pleasure of working with him through several major initiatives, many of them touching on this very real subject. And I'm going to turn it over to him right now to go ahead and take a deeper dive into his background and why he has the expertise to speak on this. So without further ado, Devlin, take it away. Thanks, Emily. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking some time uh, to join us. This is a topic that I'm fairly passionate about, but given the the shouting into the void and the noise in the market today with folks talking about AI, I wanted to give you a little bit of understanding of kind of who I am and then why my opinion might be different than some of those folks who started presenting themselves as an expert in this space six months ago. So this is me. Uh, probably the most important things you need to know. I'm married way out of my league. I'm a father of three amazing children way beyond my parenting. But the specific pieces to this topic that you're going to care about, I've been writing software for 30 years. Over 20 of those have been focused in the data platform space, written several books, uh, invented a bunch of stuff that ended up getting patented. And all of those books and patents are in the data space, from heuristics to security to privacy to machine learning. Uh, and so this has been kind of the passion of my work, uh, including open source contributions and all that. And through that time and experience, I've watched the evolution of our practices go from data collection to business intelligence to how we start leveraging that. And we're going to talk about all of those pieces and how it's changed the way developers, businesses, leaders interact with um, some of these more advanced toolkits and the things that we have to make sure that we're aware of. Uh, just like when I'm driving a 200 mile an hour race car. I need to understand a lot more than if I'm backing out of my driveway and driving a, you know, Pinto down a 30 mile an hour street. There's different concerns and different visibility that I need. So we're going to talk about those pieces today. I would encourage you, interrupt, uh, drop it in chat, drop it in the QA, uh, you know, reach out and chat with Emily. Uh, the intent of this is to be valuable to you. So if you've got questions about how we're going to be moving through this, or you hear something, and you want some more detail, or you disagree, love to have that conversation with you in somewhat of an interactive fashion. So there's a couple of common misconceptions with AI, and we got to talk about them straight out of the gate. And the reason that we've got to talk about them is so that we don't fall into the straw man arguments on either side. Now, the first of these is that AI is Terminator, that it has some general self-awareness, that it has the ability to go out and collect data and make decisions that it was never asked to make. That's largely a work of science fiction. The movie and TV space and book space in this has been huge. Whether it's Isaac Asimov's original kind of explorations of machine learning to the philosophy explorations in ancient Greece on the mechanical man to Terminator movies today. We've, we've been enthralled as a society with this perception of machines that can think for millennia. What that has done is built up this idea of what AI is, and it's not that. Now, without massive revolutionary change, 
we will not see general AI or the artificial general intelligence that is a human-like intelligence in our lifetimes. We would need massive leaps forward and revolutionary leaps forward in both computing and the amount of data available and the mathematics that we currently have. And we'd have to figure out the seven different facets of human intelligence, of which we haven't even figured out one of them really well yet. So we're probably not going to see that in our lifetimes, but it will have a massive impact on our society. The second preconception is that AI is so naive as to be dangerous or useless. Uh, one of my favorite cartoons about this, right? Like, I'm your new AI assistant. I've sorted everything, cleaned up invoices, identified inefficiencies, started layoffs, dumping the stocks, poor market reactions, sold off all the assets. This company is now insolvent, shuttering all operations. You're fired. Goodbye. While it's a logical chain of events, it's naive. Uh, and it's meant to portray the fallacy of how easy it is to break AI systems. And they are easy to break. But what I'm gonna encourage us all to do is to not fall into either camp for the rest of this hour. After this hour, jump back into it. But for this exploration of how we properly manage the machine interaction with a human world, let's suspend the two extreme arguments. Everybody good with that? Fantastic. So let's start with a brief introduction. Um, this is not your intro to AI or intro to data and analytics talk. Luckily, there's much, much smarter people in the world for this. Um, if you've attended any of the August series of talks for improving talks, you've actually heard some of the best and brightest. You've heard Scott Poulin, great expert in that space. You've heard Kevin Jordan. You've heard many amazing speakers. So I'm going to give you the brief overview, and then I'd refer you to their videos to dig deeper into some of those topics. So to put this in historical context, AI has been progressing since 1956. Now, 1956 in the Dartmouth Conference was the when we coined the term artificial intelligence. And there was predictions made from some of the leading experts that within a decade of that conference, we would have a human intelligence computer. Still not there. Over 60 years later, we're still not there. And then in the 1970s, there was a massive resurgence of AI investment. And the prediction that all human manufacturing and manual labor jobs would be gone in 50 years. When we're 50 years later, and that's not true either. And this is caused by a cycle that happens with a lot of technology. It's the cycle that's on your screen right now. This is the Gartner hype cycle. I didn't invent it. I just think it's very accurate in portraying what happens when technology progresses forward. You'll notice in the bottom left that the technology trigger happens. That's when something becomes possible because of a technological innovation. And then the folks who are innovating in the technology space, they pursue funding. They go out and they raise money and they try and build businesses around it. And every time they try and raise money, they make promises. And those promises get bigger and bigger and bigger based on the size of checks that they're trying to secure. And it ends up creating this peak of inflated expectations. Some of those promises that get made will never come true. And that's what causes the trough of disillusionment. As uh, we realize like, I still don't have my Jetsons jetpack, and I'm kind of disappointed about it. And that's where we end up then coming out of it and going, but there is useful things in this technology that allows us to shape our society. We are not yet to the peak of inflated expectations when it comes to AI. I really wish we were. We're probably several more years away. But let's look back down that curve. The technology trigger that's causing a lot of the conversation today happened in 2017. Everybody remembers the massive news cycle about open AI in 2017, right? Where hundreds of millions of people were talking about generative AI. Oh, you don't. I don't either, because it wasn't a news cycle. It was a research article that talked about the creation of a technology in AI that allowed us to translate pictures to words or words to pictures. And it took six years and tens of billions of dollars of research to create the surge in awareness that we have today. And so we're not talking about these rapid things that are going to happen. We're talking about slow and inc incremental builds and development. Now, that's good news for all of us because it gives us the time as we're building these systems, as we're integrating AI into our world, 
to have an honest conversation about how to do that really well. We're not going to have the conversation about should we apply it at all? That's the Terminator argument. And we're not going to have the, we should put it everywhere and just let it do what it's going to do because that's the kind of naive AI assistant way. What we're going to talk about is how we do it well, how we manage the human impacts while making sure that we can solve problems in ways that we couldn't solve them before. And that's going to create huge excess in value. We're going to try and manage our way so that we're not as disillusioned when AI hits the market. So let's start by defining AI. Now, my definition might be different than yours, but given that I get to talk because I created the deck and you attended, thank you, um, we're going to start with mine. So my definition is it is a simulation of human intelligence. Just like a robotic arm in a manufacturing uh, uh, factory is a simulation of a human arm. It doesn't look like a human arm. It's bulkier. It might have three joints, but it's simulating that capacity. Computers simulate intelligence from a human, but they do it in very, very different ways than we do it. And so that difference actually causes some problems. Um, it causes some problems in how that difference shows up. And that's the thing we're going to focus on today. Now, I want to boil this down to the simplest. If there's an AI expert in the audience, you're going to look at this and you're going to go, you're wrong. I am. I'm generalizing to make the, the topic more approachable. And we can definitely, if you'd like, reach out. I'd love to sit down one-on-one -on -one and chat through a bunch of the, the nuances of this. But unless we're going to get into linear algebra and lose most of the audience, I'm going to stay pretty high level in general today. So AI as a field is the giant umbrella that we deal with. And that umbrella largely takes rules. Those rules could be a, written by a human because they're an expert in um, healthcare in a specific area or an expert in mathematics or an expert in logistics. And they write rules to help run the software systems in logistics or healthcare or uh, financials. That type of AI is called expert systems because an expert wrote the rules. And then we paired up new information or data with those rules and we got a prediction or an outcome. So data and rules come in one side, outcomes or uh, results and predictions come out the other. Now, what that means for us is that uh, what we've learned from the past is then applied to the, the present to predict the future. That's AI in general. The biggest questions are how we write the rules. That's it. So when we talk about training AI, we're creating the rules. Now, one of the biggest ways that is coming up today, and it's the kind of core technology and approach to these deep learning models, um, is machine learning. It is by feeding a lot of data and known results that the computer can algorithmically, using a kind of reductive math, come out with new rules that humans didn't have to write. Now, because computers can do things over and over and over very rapidly, it can actually write much, much more rules than is reasonably feasible if I'm paying a software development team. But in that difference, we lose human oversight of what all those detailed rules are. Now, there's the explainable AI movement that's actually talking about from a result, from a prediction, I need to be able to explain the rules that got me there. But keep in mind, that's after we've trained it. After the rules are built, explain how they're being used. The How the rules are built is incredibly complex. And so we're going to be focusing a lot of our conversation around machine learning because it's kind of the focus of the industry today. But this generally applies to all different types of um, artificial intelligence research, whether that's cognitive research or statistical modeling in the Bayesian kind of space um, or symbolic logic. Really, all of them would apply in different ways to the topics we're talking about today. Now, when we talk about building a machine learning model, model can literally just translate to rule set or equation. When we build that rule set, there are a couple of places that problems can come into 
the development. And we're going to talk about the potential for failure in each of those areas. And then we're going to talk about the potential types of failure that could come in. So roughly speaking, this is how almost every model built today is built. Um, you have the training cycle, which the training cycle is this upper right-hand corner loop where we train the model, we test it, judge whether it's better, update the weights and biases, and then retrain it. And we do that loop over and over and over and over, and we get to a better and better and better model. Um, now, this model could be identifying pictures. It could be finding patterns in data. It could be deciding mortgage lending. But we're evaluating whether it's a better model often. Now, this is one of the places where human bias or human naivete can cause an ethical question. How do we define better? Now, let's take our mortgage approval example. Is better the most profitability on that mortgage? Is better diversity of the people we're approving? Is better opportunity for somebody if it's their first house? Is better lower risk? Is better that the houses that we're taking loans against are lucrative for the bank if they have to foreclose and able to resell? So that is risk avoidance. Or is better some mixture of all those things? Now, some of the worst ethical conundrums we end up with is when we define better to be very, very small, right? Profitability or eliminating the default of a mortgage. But we forget to include that we also don't want the mortgage approval system to be racist. We don't want it to be sexist. We don't want it to only lend to people who don't need to borrow money. We want it to give opportunity. Now, keep in mind, we want it to is a statement of both the business and the society. So we as a society have have laws that it say you cannot take into account these facets of somebody's information in making a lending decision. That's we as a society trying to define better. But then as a business, you go, all right, so our business target is million dollar plus homes. You're going to have a different definition of better than me if I'm running a business that lends to first time homeowners. And so the society gets to set some rules. We as the business get to set some rules. And then the market and the consumer gets to set some rules. Because we may not have a law that says you can't do that. But there may be a social construct that says you shouldn't do that. And this is where ethics comes in. Now, ethics is simply a moral set of standards that guide behavior. And that moral set of standards, we codify into laws, but we also kind of agree socially too. So when we define better, that's a big set of problems. And we'll talk about how those problems show up and what we can do to protect from them here in a minute. Now, if I go into the model life cycle, I record those settings and then I adjust kind of the hyperparameters. Now, hyperparameters are the piece that the, the learning model can't change. Those are the ones we as developers or human beings that are building these models get to change. And so by adjusting hyperparameters, I can significantly change the outputs of the model. But if I adjust those hyperparameters, I might actually introduce my own bias or assumptions into um, the equation. So let's say I'm looking at a predictive model for an engagement ring. Now, traditionally I've heard for years and years from family and relatives and society and diamond companies and jewelers and all this, that I should spend three months salary on that. And so when we're building the model to find diamonds and recommend it, we're going to put in a budget hyperparameter that is, you know, salary divided by 12 times three. That's me baking in a biased assumption based on things I've heard and I've learned as the developer. It might not actually be true, or it might only be true in certain societies 
But then it turns out that our jewelry company does really, really well. And we expand into other markets and other markets think you should spend one month's salary or six months salary. And now my recommender engine is broken. It's not making good recommendations because I baked a biased assumption that was culturally centered to where I was going to use the model into the model itself. And so we end up with this kind of conundrum of, are we through that biased example, am I encouraging good financial decisions? It might be good for me and my business in the jewelry space, but is it good for the long-term financial health of our users? And these are the questions that us as developers, as business leaders, as we approach this AI space, we're all going to be able to influence in, in little ways throughout this cycle, the outcome to the societal good, to the company good, and to the individual kind of interconnected human good. And then lastly, the place that these kind of biases and the ethical questions can come up is in gathering and preparing data. Now, I used a mortgage example earlier. I'm going to use another mortgage example, and it's in a bit of a touchy area. Um, if I'm looking at lending and default rates in the United States and housing value, some of the data I gather is going to be from places that had what, called, what are called red line laws. Now, red line laws were written to keep uh, people of color and minorities out of white suburbs. That's the intent of those laws. Now, if I'm looking at housing data and I'm looking at home values and those kind of things, the data itself might not have that kind of racist tilt to it. The person preparing the data might not have that tilt to them. But I end up having to, when I'm preparing that data, I have to adjust for some of those things or not. And that's the ethical question is, are you responsible in doing the data engineering for trying to protect, uh, trying to correct some of these kind of societal history, or do we just train it on the history we have and allow it to continue to grow on new history? Now, I'm not advocating that there is a right or wrong answer. That's I'm not standing up here making a moral claim. What I am saying is that there's an ethical question in how we approach those problems. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So I want to pause here. I've said a lot and we've walked through kind of the overview of the problem space. Are there any questions so far? No questions in the chat uh, that I see so far. Does anyone have, uh, would anyone like to speak up or add to anything at this time? always the most comfortable problem in the world to talk about. Yeah, I'm sure that's why everyone's raising their hand. But we'll <laughs> keep an eye out in case any more questions come up. This is all fascinating information, and I'm sure many people have not had to think about this in depth before. So let it, uh, let it sink in. Absolutely. Now, we talked about, in this case, how to build the model. Now, one of the advantages of AI, and especially in the machine learning space, is its ability to learn quickly, to take in new information and to progress and adjust. So what ends up happening is we start with a set of assumptions, and we're going to build a model to test those assumptions. When we do that, we're expecting the upward spiral on the left, that we're going to start with our data set, and we're going to learn things from it, and everything we learn from it is going to be positive and additive, and it's going to lead us to a better world. It's going to help us to cure cancer and decarbonize the environment and a whole bunch of other things. And I think that's going to be true. The same way when we talked about like social media a decade and a half, two decades ago, um, that it was going to make us a more interconnected world, and it was going to allow people to share ideas more freely. All of that's true. But then you've got to look at the negative side of it is it can also start with that base premise and learn some pretty terrible things. Now, one of the terrible examples I'm going to use is not a fault of the company that published it. So I don't want anybody to look at it and be like, ah, that shows that Microsoft is evil or Apple is evil. That's not the purpose of this example. The purpose is to talk about us as humans and how we deal with these systems. So Microsoft released a chatbot called Microsoft Tay. 
You can look this up. There's tons of stories about it. It got banned from Twitter. It got banned from Twitter because it was a chat bot interacting with the populace and it became very racist, bigoted and conspiracy theory. And it was spouting all this stuff. Um, now, this is caused by two effects. One is the negative reinforcement of self-learning for these machine learning algorithms. So it spiraled down very, very, very quickly. But the second piece is more of a societal question, which is what we call the uncanny valley in the AI research space. Now, the uncanny valley is actually caused by the reception of sufficiently advanced technology at a visceral or emotional human level. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna tell you a personal story that I'm certain my wife and my daughter will not enjoy. So we were traveling uh, recently and we were walking through an international airport and there was a makeup place that had an animatronic head. And so the back of it was all robotics, but the front of it was a uh, skin-like texture and it had eyes and a jaw and lips and all that. And it was about 20 feet tall. And it's it's turning back and forth and it's looking at people. And we're walking from across the big international terminal. So it's not, it's not close, right? But you can see it moving around. And that was okay. I was like, hey, this is cool. And I'm excited about it and I'm nerding out on it. And we go walking towards it. And it turns towards us and blinks. And instantly, my wife and daughter went, nope and turned around to leave. What we had hit is the AI equivalent, is the equivalent of the AI's uncanny valley. There's a certain point in the advancement of technology where we're really excited. And the moment we cross over that advancement, as a society and as individuals, we react to that technology as a threat because it's trying to be too human. And it's like, oh no. And so our kind of tribal brain goes, that's not human, it's an attack. And we either fight, we flight, or we freeze. Now, the way that shows up in AI, let's take the chatbot example from Microsoft Tay, is I either disengage with it entirely. I say, nope, I'm not using that AI product. Or that's the, the flee. The freeze is to just ignore it. Like, I'll, I'll keep using stuff. I'll just ignore the AI piece. That's the freeze. But the fight is... Let me see if I can break this. So hundreds of thousands of people interacted with the chatbot with the intent to break it, to see what they could get it to say. And we taught it a lot of terrible things through this reinforcement loop. Now, Microsoft Tay is used as a great research example because there were no protection systems baked into its interactions. You do not see that in chatbots today whether it's Google Bard or Bing Chat or GPT or Llama or any of the others out there today, they all have protection systems. That is human protection to make sure that hate speech and harassment and racial slurs don't get taught to it. And those protection systems actually filter what it's allowed to see, but also what it's allowed to respond with. And we've made that as a a try to stop the downward learning trend because we as society and as businesses and as the market all said with a clarion voice, we don't want AI inflaming the human conflict we already have. Now, does that mean everybody agrees with that sentence? No, but the majority of us do, which is why Microsoft and Amazon and Meta and Google and all the big people and uh, all the big companies investing in the growth of AI-based technologies are also investing in the protection systems to make sure that they can be used appropriately because they don't want their brand associated with the next great racist chatbot, right? They also want people to have a positive reception to their products. And so what they're trying to do is avoid that kind of reaction. It is an ethical question that they've decided to go this direction to help stave off some of the negative moral conflicts. Now, the good news is that we're getting better at solving these kinds of conundrums. 
The bad news is we have more visibility to those conundrums than we ever have in the past. And that's the complexity problem. So as we get better and better and better at understanding both human behavior and parsing the data that comes out of human behavior, right? We generate roughly a half a yotta byte of data a year as a civilization, which means that every second of your life, awake, sleep, as long as you're breathing, you're generating about eight megabytes of data. We're getting better at parsing that and getting better at understanding it, which means we can also see more complexity. Now, the good news is this complexity can largely lead us to good questions. It, it probably won't give us perfect answers. Now, almost everybody has opened up Excel and charted something, right? It looks like this. One size fits all, very simple. I can make decisions. Yeah, sure, it might be a little guesswork. We might do some rounding, fill in some blank numbers. But we find kind of, here's the pattern that fits the data. It's accurate. It's just not very precise. Now, if I take that same data and I analyze it with machine learning, then I end up with something that looks like this, where I'm using, in this case, a topological graph to show hotspots in data. Now, the punchline to the story is it's the same thing. It's the same data. But one of them gives me much more visibility so that I can actually target to the things I'm likely to miss. Whether that's demographics of customers I'm likely to not serve, or it's a ethical question in mortgage lending, or it's showing me purchasing behavior in my jewelry company that we made up at the beginning of this call. In each of these cases, the additional complexity and the ability to understand it leads us to better questions. I can take this and go, hey, based on the, the simple linear model, I can make decisions based on that. I can make better decisions with more visibility to complexity. The more data I add and make a part of this conversation, the better I can make those decisions. You'll notice that the curve deals pretty well with four of the six hotspots. From the top, le top left and middle, it's, it's close. To the bottom right, it's pretty close. But you've got an island in the bottom dead center and an island in the top right that just get missed. Now, if I'm talking about jewelry sales, that's lost profit. What if I'm talking about people who can't buy a house? That's a much deeper impact. And so we have to put the visibility of complexity beside the business problem we're solving. Now, the fun one is looking at this and going, well, what if that is the ability to identify a human being based on sensor data from a car? If I'm a self-driving car, I need the complexity. I need the visibility because I don't want to hit a pedestrian in a, walk, in a crosswalk. And so those two hotspots might be incredibly high risk if I'm missing them. And so I start asking better and deeper questions. It means that instead of a one size fits all answer, I probably have to have six different answers. But it means that I'm less likely to have some of those risks and some of those kind of conundrums of um, we wrote naive code that impacted people's lives. So let's, we've talked about how all this shows up. We've talked about the visibility of complexity. We're going to talk about the types of complexity and why that happens. Now, this is one of my favorite XKCDs. They're fantastic. I love their comics. Um, this is our machine learning system. We pour our data into a pile and we ask it questions. And if the answers are wrong, we just stir the pile. That's most people's interaction with machine learning nowadays is we've got data pipelines into a data lake and we're just asking it questions. It's like, okay, let's talk about how this happens. Now, mistruth of commission is the first type of mistake that can come in. And in our training model earlier, this is a gathered data problem, right? So when you look at the big um, model definition piece, um, we end up with a, um, at the very beginning, gather and prepare data. So when I gather data, I'm not sure if I've been lied to. And we put lies of commission intentionally lying into systems every day. 
every day. Now, some of these are what we consider societally as like white lies. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the, uh, if you've ever been to like salary.com. So salary.com, you enter in, here's your salary. And the, the sociological studies tell us that you are likely to overstate your salary by between 10 and 18% because it makes us feel better. We're, we're worth more in our heads. Like, wow, this should be my salary. Now, if I'm doing an analysis of what software development salaries in the Bay Area look like, I have these lies of commission in my data set. So can I chop all the salaries in the data set by 18%? Well, no, because then I've got a different problem. And so you end up with this inability to trust the accuracy and validity of the data without adding in some additional perspectives. There are also kind of the check-in and timesheets. We were working on a um, time tracking system for manufacturing and construction. And they on the workers on their phones would check in to the job site and that's when they'd start getting paid. And what we found is that we had some interesting data, like three people would check in from the same phone, but the same three people would check in from a different phone the next day. And investigating this, we found that, hey, check me in, I'm on my way. I'm picking up breakfast for you, me and Bob. And one person would check everybody in the next day. Hey, check me in, I did it for you yesterday. And so what we ended up doing was putting protections to keep some of these mistruths of commissions out of the system in which we would geofence it and you had to log in, you had to check in from your device or with your supervisor's device. And so you create these protection systems for lies of commissions. Now, mistruth of omission is a little harder to find. Everything I said was true. I just didn't say everything. Um, my favorite version of this actually doesn't have to deal with people. Sensor data has mistruths of omission in it all the time. And we use sensor data to detect shut-ins on drilling rigs and to shut off pressure valves and those kind of things. Uh, the Boeing 737-800 had some errant sensor data as well. Every once in a while, it would have a blank spot in the data or it'd have a false reading. Now, the blank spot in the data is actually the mistruth of omission that we're talking about. What happens when we start reacting to those omissions, where we look at the emptiness of data as proof that something's gone wrong rather than the sensor has failed? And so we have to start co correcting for these things. Um, if I'm running an insurance company and I'm looking at police reports, it goes, the driver did not see the other vehicle. It typically doesn't then go on to say, because they admitted they were on their phone. And so you end up having to do a lot of kind of pattern analysis for distracted driving and those kind of things, because we typically omit some of the most important pieces of data. And this allows us to build systems trained on that data that have that misunderstanding of reality baked into their decision making. Now, mistruth of perspective is harder because there's really no way to correct for it. Now, in the mythical company I'm about to talk about, I'm sure this doesn't happen for anybody like your companies, where you have interpersonal conflict between two people. And Jane is talking to John, and they're having a conflict. If I talk to Jane, and I talk to John, and I average their two stories, do I find the truth? Probably not. I might know that Jane's really mad at John, because somebody ate her yogurt and she thinks it's John, but John's lactose intolerant and I ate her yogurt. At which point, the truth isn't the average of their two perspectives, but a completely different thing that's outside their perspectives. And so what we end up with is having to look at this for systems that are making decisions. We have the persona or the perspective of the mortgage lender. We have the persona or the perspective of the applicant or the borrower. We have the persona or the perspective of the underwriter, and we have to weigh each of those, and we have to decide which persona's opinions are more important. 
And that conversation is truly important because it allows us to balance the biases that come in through this kind of data. Now, the last two are going to be the hardest to overcome, and they are the bias because of history or perspective that was tainting the way they come in. Now, this could be confirmation bias because you only ask the questions that you want to hear the answers to, to the point that this could also be um, racial bias baked into our mortgage and lending data from red line laws um, to looking at the historical gender distribution of software developers and using that as a justification for not changing. Like the mistruth of bias, when we start looking at data and facts, we have to adjust for, but that's only going to be a human constraint because humans are gonna be bringing in those pieces of information and that historical perspective. We don't yet have a way to teach computers to look for bias. Um, in a kind of broad ranging general fashion. There are a few specific tools that are built for this in detecting specific biases, but they're also only in specific use cases like medical recommendations for cancer patients looking for bias based on the perspective of the doctor, those kind of things. And then lastly, the mistruth of frame of reference. Now, frame of reference means that like basic data becomes nearly unintelligible because there's just no historical precedent. There's no frame to reference um, where we can compare it to previous data. Now, in 2020, in about March-ish, I don't remember the exact dates, something happened that we didn't have any historical precedent for. We didn't have the you know, financial trading algorithms, had no idea how to deal with it. Our medical systems had no idea how to predict patient flow. We didn't even know how to predict what to do to protect from COVID. Now, I fast forward three years. We got this pretty well down. We know it because we have a frame of reference. And that's not to say we have it perfectly solved, but that we can deal with it better and we can understand the basic data because we have that frame of reference that we didn't have before. Because the 1918, 1919 Spanish flu outbreaks, we didn't have as much medical data. We didn't have nearly as robust of a healthcare system worldwide that we have today. And so there was no frame of reference to manage it from. Now, typically the way to deal with that particular problem in our systems, when we talk about limiting the impact of bias, is to put circuit breakers where if I hit a frame of reference where there's no historical analogy or I'm below a certain level of confidence, don't act, get a human involved, right? Where if you ask chat GPT something and it's like, I can't answer you, I have no idea, right? Those kinds of areas where we've put in a circuit breaker and said, you're not going down that road. The same thing we did with the chat systems for like Microsoft Tay and those kind of things is, Nope, we're going we're gonna to put in a circuit breaker and protect. You'll notice a pattern here. Mistruth of commission, we, if we are aware of it, we can protect with it somewhat. Mistruth of omission is hard to detect. Mistruth of perspective is hard to detect. Biases and frame of references are hard to get rid of entirely. But what we end up having to do is put protection systems, so shackles on the AI, so that we protect it from making the naive mistakes while leveraging its superpowers. If we do this well, we will see the healthcare advancements, the chemical research, the environmental sustainability, a lot of the things that we talked about as potential good at the very beginning. Um, this is the AI generated image for AI for good, by the way, uh, and making things more inclusive and, you know, um, making it so that folks who are differently able than have different disabilities can interact with society at a near parity level. Right now, that might be too labor intensive to be economically viable, but by using AI, we might actually be able to get there. It will also be used for bad. And this is the, the piece that everybody's fearful of of autonomous weapons or cybersecurity attacks or using it for uh, phishing or discrimination, those kind of things. This is the natural evolution of a new technology is that we're going to discover 
good and bad uses. We're going to discover new responsibilities and new ethical questions. And so while I don't have a silver bullet for you, being aware of the problem spaces, being aware of where they come into your particular solutions and software development and, and your business, and then asking good questions will lead us to a place in which we can deal with this new technology and we can be responsible as we do so. So it's a lot of information and a lot of kind of nuanced pieces that I hope was incredibly valuable for you. I want to open it up for questions before handing it back over to Emily and wrapping up. I don't see any questions in the chat, but does anybody have anything that they would like to maybe um, come off of mute and ask or any final thoughts before we part ways? Here, I've got one for you. Several countries worldwide are introducing understanding of AI as part of school curriculum, starting as soon as elementary school. What are your thoughts on that? So I think this is incredibly important. I think it's incredibly important for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm a big fan of taking advantage of what's called the compression effect. Compression effect is actually a child's ability to assimilate hugely complex topics very young which is why our education system focuses so much on the first like 18 to 24 years of life is our ability to integrate information and compress it leads to an expansion and acceleration of our society as a whole. Um, it is hard to deal with a society in which you don't understand the underlying pieces, right? Um, so whether that's teaching children to code because technology is gonna be a huge part of their lives, even if they choose not to go into coding, they should understand how software and technology drive our world. AI is going to be that same space of like, here's what it is. Here's how it's working so that you can understand it. I also believe that doing this with things like rhetoric, like how to make a good argument to persuade somebody is equally as important when I'm trying to use it as when somebody's trying to use it on me. If I understand the tools you're using, I can deconstruct your argument and see if I agree with you. And so it's, those types of things, especially to young children. Now, the hardest part about this is making it approachable in a way that they can consume based on their current understanding of systems and tools and mathematics and those kind of things. But I believe that that kind of reasonable compression is actually a space in which we'll be able to leverage some of these tools to help teach about these tools, but largely is going to be a good thing for us as long as we don't introduce it as the concept of Here's a magic box. Now, this wasn't part of the question uh, that Sarah asked, Devlin, but this is my curiosity. Do you think that um, when you talk about teaching AI, especially to young kids, does it need to go hand in hand with ethics or do you start teaching the two as separate topics? Sometimes ethics has come up until later in, in education. It's interesting. Um, so uh, the overall space in this is called character education. And there's, there's arguments for and against. Largely, nobody disagrees with we should teach character and we should teach ethics. What we disagree with is what should be a part of those courses. Is it, is it my view of what's moral and true and good? Is it yours? Do we allow religion into that conversation? Do we teach to a minimum bar? Those are the questions that I don't think technology is ever going to answer. Um, I think humans are going to have to come together on that. Now, learning how to compromise and learning ethics and moral, not here are the morals you should have, but here's how to evaluate them is incredibly important. And I think teaching people to explore problems and explore ideas that are different from their own is probably one of the most sustainable to our society things we could approach in this space. Excellent. Good points there. Well, we've got another question that came in. Vaughn asked, how does somebody help, uh, how, how does somebody find help on fixing their bias when you can only be changing your biases for somebody else's biases? Who is unbiased? Uh, so it's a great question. The answer is um, nobody. Nobody's unbiased. Not all bias is bad. Now I'm action biased. I prefer to act. Once I come to a like, all right, decide to act. I don't like kind of sitting with a decision and seeing how it feels. That means sometimes I'm going to solve problems better and faster than other people. And sometimes I'm going to make them worse. 
So don't look to fix your biases. Look to balance them. Look to consider the alternative. Now, when I say biases, I'm talking about like, I believe that this is a better choice. If we're talking about like racial discrimination, if we're talking about dis uh, harassment, that's gone beyond bias into discriminatory belief. So those, you should fix those. <laughs> but when it comes to biases, this is why diversity in a room matters hugely. It's why inclusivity is a core thing that Improving strives for is because we're not actually looking to have a hundred unbiased people in the room. We're looking for a balance of bias that leads us to the best path for all of us. So I would say, find somebody who disagrees with you that you can have a civil conversation with and explore both sides of it. It'll be valuable on both sides. And if you've got a decision you think you're being weighted, find somebody with the opposite opinion to discuss it with. Kind of goes back to the importance, I think you've mentioned, and I know several other people have, on having um, so many different people involved in AI, even if that's not something that they feel is a core part of their job. It's just having the exposure and the perspective and, and the ideas. And we, we've approached this in the, the AI space with uh, kind of the red team, white team uh, approach from journalism is you have one team that is the kind of white team um, that goes out and kind of fights the infection or solves the problem, right? The white blood cells. But then the red team, red blood cells who come in and clean up afterwards, they evaluate the solution for that wide angle lens. A in AI spaces, this is actually very, very effective. Before you go to production, having a group of people that weren't part of building it, look for places in which bias might have creeped in or went unsolved. That kind of human check system, or even automating some of those check systems with analysis tools and that can actually be incredibly powerful for protecting from the negative outcomes of a bias that made it in unintentionally. Coming off of mute there. Well, I don't see any other questions. Final opportunity to drop them in or uh, raise your hand if you had any. Not, no. Well, then I just want to take a moment, Devlin, to thank you for your time today. This was an excellent presentation. I know I walked away with several things to, several things I learned and several things to think about, especially in a world where I constantly hear oh, isn't it nice whenever AI replaces you at your job? I'll be like, don't worry. I have a bit to say on that. Um, so again, we appreciate your time. I want to thank you, uh, everybody who was able to attend today and uh, share your lunch break with us. This was, um, it's always a great opportunity to um, come together with other people interested in the same topics. Just a reminder, we do this every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central. Our next week's topic is called Maximizing Value, Exploring FinOps and Prodicizing AI. I'm saying that word right. That should be another fantastic um, presentation about how to use AI in our day-to-day -day life. And of course, if you've attended this one and next one, I'm sure you'll have a bunch of questions that you'll be able to bring after your extended knowledge from today. We hope to see you again at one of our other presentations and make sure to see, check out our website at improving.com and you can follow us on uh, every social media outlet out there. Without further ado, Devlin, thank you and everyone have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you.